monsters. Donald Harvey was born on April 15, 1952, in Hamilton, Ohio. It is not uncommon for serial killers to live double lives, and so it was with Donald Harvey. Like Alex DeLarge in A Clockwork Orange, he was unfailingly polite and respectful to adults. To his peers at school, he was somebody else entirely. To his teachers, he came across as mild-mannered, perky, and gentle. To the students, he was quiet, but he was far more unapproachable and remembered as a loner. Why was he so quiet? What was he hiding? The answers could have been found in his domestic life. Six months after he was born, his father dropped him right on his head. So from the get-go, we're not looking at a clear bill of mental neurological health. It was an accident. His father, Ray, was rocking baby Donald with the intention of putting him to sleep. The problem was, Ray was himself very drowsy, so much so he fell asleep on his feet. Considering that the soft spot in Donald's skull hadn't closed over yet, this was bound to be disastrous for his cognitive and psychological functioning. Donald's mother, Goldie, stormed into the room and chastised Ray for dropping Donald. They got into a huge fight. It was an issue that would reemerge throughout the years and drive a wedge between them. Though it appeared that Donald was normal, time would scour away the facade of normalcy to reveal the menace within. Goldie was so hell-bent on revenge, she reported the incident to a newspaper. The betrayal Ray felt when Goldie took the story public was acute and profound. Goldie and Ray fought constantly, and it was devastating for Donald to witness, let alone find himself as the subject of debate, which he often was. When a child's parents fight in front of them, it can be a very distressing experience for the child. Their parents are their rock, and it is a moment when they feel that the rock, as the foundation of their lives, is crumbling. It could be argued that fighting in front of your children is emotional abuse, though this is open to debate. Goldie and Ray were not happy with each other anymore and fell out of love, though they stayed together for the sake of the children, which is something that seldom does the children any good. With the icy, stilted relations and hostility between them, it only left the children growing up in a battlefield. Their children were prisoners of war until they moved out. Their parents were frequently neglectful, contributing to Donald's turmoil. This didn't represent the entirety of the torments suffered by Donald Harvey as a boy. He was sexually abused on a regular basis by his uncle, a few of his cousins, and a neighbor. His uncle Wayne lived at his grandmother's house, and Goldie never suspected that her half-brother could be capable of such a thing. Wayne began molesting Donald when he was four years old. It began with hand jobs. Being so young and provincial, Donald wasn't aware that it was wrong for a grown man to elicit such a favor from a child and relative. Once Wayne made this practice routine, he decided he could get away with escalating the abuse. Soon, Wayne had Donald filleting him. It hadn't occurred to Donald that his consent was disregarded by his uncle and that he wasn't capable of giving consent at the age of four in the first place. He also assumed that, as such a young child, there was no other choice but to obey the man, since he was an adult. Donald's parents were so wrapped up in defending their own positions within their constant skirmishes to take notice of the fact that their son was a very troubled young man. Eventually, another man set his sights on sexually abusing Donald. 
Dan Thomas was the family's neighbor, and he caught sight of Wayne's lecherous gaze with Donald in its crosshairs. Donald did the math and figured out that there was a secret between Donald and Wayne, like a private club with two members, and Thomas wanted a cut of the action. One afternoon when Ray and Goldie were out, Dan Thomas invited Donald to his home. Thomas subjected him to the same tortures he endured at the hands of his Uncle Wayne. Nevertheless, Donald would flee to Dan Thomas's house when his parents were fighting. It wasn't exactly the kind of attention he was seeking, but he saw in Dan Thomas someone who paid attention to him and wouldn't leave him embroiled within his parents' acrimonious relations. Though Dan Thomas's brand of affection may have been inappropriate, illegal, and morally wrong, it was affection nonetheless, and the lesser of two evils, as Donald saw it at the time. Donald has noted that Thomas paid him for his sexual output on occasion. That same year, another head injury befell Donald. He was standing on the running board of a truck when he slipped and fell head first. There was a four-inch cut on his head as a result. The flesh wound was remedied. The neurological impact, not so much. Donald's life vacillated between the screaming matches and occasional physical dust-ups of his parents' confrontations and the sexual abuse visited upon him by his uncle and neighbor. It must have seemed to young Donald like the entire world was full of hostility and lecherous opportunists. Either way, he found no relief from his suffering. People who abuse children regularly, especially a single victim on a regular basis, normalize the abuse in the victim's mind, since the unspoken message is, this is going to be a fixture in your life, and there is nothing you can do about it, because I am the adult, and I can prevail upon you, submit, or suffer even worse tortures. He didn't feel loved at home, and the so-called love he received from the pedos was motivated only by the abuser's narcissistic drive to gratify themselves. With so much to keep secret, is it any wonder that he would learn to hide his emotions and disclose little to others about his personal life? The sexual abuse perpetrated against Donald by Wayne and Dan Thomas continued until Donald was 20 years old. Whenever Donald visited his grandmother, Wayne swept him into a private room without delay so he could use Donald as a masturbation tool. Secretly, Donald came to enjoy the sex, even though deep down he knew it was wrong. Donald was a shy and retiring attendee of any social occasion. His disposition was interpreted as being the product of manners and good breeding. He didn't mingle, but a typical child's idea of mingling can test the patience of adults, so his behavior in mixed company was well received. His silence was appreciated by his teachers in school. While other boys were wrestling and getting into mischief, he sat quietly in a chair. He was every elementary teacher's dream student. He was a clock watcher, not because of school itself, but because he wanted to get away from the social atmosphere. Ultimately, children his age were much too boisterous for his liking. He was also remembered as an intelligent boy who received good grades. He didn't enjoy high school, which he found to be boring and devoid of valuable data. In fact, he dropped out. He got his GED through correspondence courses offered by Chicago's American School at the age of 16. It was around this time that Donald Harvey began to embark on his first romantic relationship. He was gay and became involved with a young man named James Peluso, 
Unlike his parents' marriage, relations with his boyfriend were harmonious, though the two broke up sporadically and got back together almost as often. This relationship continued off and on for 15 years. Meanwhile, Donald continued having sex with Dan and Wayne, as previously mentioned, until he was 20 years old, still aware that pedophilia and pederasty were morally and legally wrong. He pursued these encounters as a source of fast cash, now and then. And again, he enjoyed the sex by this time. Donald learned to trust no one. He had been manipulated and would learn to manipulate others. He was tired of being controlled by others and fully intended to be autonomous. His first venture in his quest to control others was in his relationship with James. He was always the one to end the relationship so that he would not find himself at James's mercy, as he had been with most people in his life. Another motivation was the freedom to see other men, Wayne and Dan among them. The lack of commitment left him free, and he enjoyed this state of affairs. Donald and James would still have sex on occasion. Even then, Donald called the shots. Freedom and self-determination were denied to him as he grew up, and he was compensating where he saw it was lacking. One way to further his independence was to get a job. He was hired by a factory. He didn't enjoy the work, but the financial compensation was enough to bolster his lifestyle to the point where he could support himself. Now that he was financially self-sustaining, his next move was to move out of his parents' house so that he could finally have some peace in his domestic life. Though he was laid off not long after getting hired, Donald saved enough money to move to London, Kentucky, where his grandfather lived. The year was 1970, and he was 18 years old. He was looking forward to a life of freedom as an adult. It was also a huge relief to get away from his parents and their contentious relationship. After getting settled in Kentucky, Donald was hired to work as a nursing assistant at Marymount Hospital. He was looking forward to the future. Donald visited his ailing grandfather at the facility and kept him company. In so doing, Donald established friendly relations with doctors, nurses, and other staff at the hospital who interacted with and took care of his grandfather. He befriended the staff and so impressed them with his social skills that he was offered a job as an orderly. Donald performed many medical duties. He dispensed medication, inserted catheters, gave the elderly patients their baths, and provided other miscellaneous care. He was soon considered to be among the best orderlies in the hospital. He was diligent, thorough, and flexible. Patients and staff alike were satisfied with his performance. What neither were aware of was that it was all motivated by a desire for control. His patients and employers needed him. If he had called in sick without notice, it would have left them in a bind, and he liked the fact that the operations of the hospital hinged partially on his output. At this time, Donald had a roommate named Randy White. The power dynamic in their relationship was skewed entirely in Randy's direction. Randy was also gay and soon expressed interest in Donald as a sexual prospect. He tried sending hints to Donald, but they did not show up on his radar. Finally, Randy decided to take drastic measures. He raped Donald. After years of being sexually abused by Dan and Wayne, Donald was accustomed to being the victim in a sexual abuse scenario, so he did not resist the assault. After embarking on this new life where he could run from the powerlessness he suffered as a child, now Randy White stripped him of this power. As he had with James, Donald would be driven to compensate for the power that had been misappropriated from him. 
March 27th, 1971. Donald Harvey resigned from his position at Marymount Hospital. His motivation for quitting remains a mystery. Three days later, Donald ran afoul of the law for the first time. He didn't know what to do with himself. He was wired and weary, so he went to a bar and got drunk. When he returned home, he robbed the apartment building in which he was living and got arrested for burglary. While he was in police custody, the cops didn't just question him about the robbery. They also wanted to know about the occult materials he had on his person at the time. Donald buckled under the pressure and suddenly confessed to murdering 15 people at Marymount Hospital. The police found this confession both shocking and implausible. Their first impression of him was as a drunkard with no criminal record. If you spend enough time around drunks and police encounter them on an all-too-regular basis, you'll hear anything from their mouths. Regardless, they investigated the claims and found no evidence to support them. Donald Harvey was charged with petty theft and paid a small fine. The presiding judge recommended psychiatric treatment for Donald. Donald elected to enlist in the Air Force instead. Though he completed basic training, he left nine months later. Like with the hospital, he was tight-lipped about his reasons for leaving. He received an honorable discharge. Donald returned to Kentucky. He was so depressed at this time that he checked into the VA hospital and received treatment for a month. He struggled to accept his homosexuality and was frequently depressed and suicidal as he came to terms with it. He was hospitalized for mental health issues twice. Despite the treatments he received, nothing could cure him of his misery. From 1972, he worked intermittently for two years, mostly as a support worker in hospitals and convalescent homes. In 1974, he chose another occupation, telephone operator. After a year of taking calls, he returned to health care, this time working as a clerk at St. Luke's Medical Hospital. He grew tired of this job, as with the others. Donald Harvey craved a sweeping change in his life. He decided to move out of Kentucky. He moved as far afield as Cincinnati, Ohio, where he worked as a nursing assistant at the VA hospital. His position at that facility was similar to the work he performed at Marymount. He took on additional duties, working as a housekeeping assistant. He changed bed linens, cleaned bathrooms, among other duties. He eventually took on more training, becoming a cardiac catheterization technician and an autopsy assistant. He got into mischief at the morgue. When no one else was around, he would take tissue samples from a corpse and study it at home. July 18, 1985. Donald Harvey was caught with a duffel bag at work containing suspicious items. These included a cocaine spoon, hypodermic needles, surgical scissors, surgical gloves, books about aspects of the occult, a 38 caliber pistol, and several comparably unremarkable items. Police searched his work locker and found a specimen of human liver. No onions. Just kidding, just some morbid humor. Donald was not convicted due to faulty police work. The consequences to Donald Harvey were the termination of his employment and a $50 fine. Following a protracted period of unemployment, Donald resumed his career as a nursing aide, this time at the Drake Memorial Hospital in 1986. Meanwhile, Donald Harvey had a busy personal life, what with frequent sexual encounters, relationships, 
and his involvement with the occult. Being raped by Randy White took a toll on his psyche, however, and the healing process was ongoing. He hoped for a better future, believing it was in the realm of possibility. It was about this time that he met a man named Vernon Midden. Midden was an undertaker. He was also married with children. Despite their other commitments, an attraction and bond developed between the two men, and they embarked on a love affair. The relationship persisted for seven months. It wasn't all sex and romance. Like the considerate lover that he was, Vernon taught Donald the tricks of the undertaking trade. For instance, he would show him how a body would change after a smothering. It was like murder school. It was Vernon who led Donald by the penis straight into the occult. Vernon was a member of a coven, though Donald was not permitted to join and could not participate in rituals, even as an onlooker. If Donald wanted hot black candle wax dripped on his scrotum, he would have had to look elsewhere. In January 1971, Donald and Vernon's relationship deteriorated like a rotting corpse. They were not getting along and argued about as frequently as Donald's parents. The fights only got worse and eventually Donald fell into a depression. He also began to fantasize about embalming Vernon alive following a breakup. June 1971. Donald Harvey tried committing suicide for the first time. In a botched attempt at asphyxiation, he only succeeded in lighting an unoccupied apartment in his building on fire. Firefighters saved him despite his objections. For this, Donald did time in prison and was slapped with a $50 fine. Having been released from prison, Donald moved to Frankfort, Kentucky. He began looking for a new job shortly after his arrival. He rented a room in a private residence. He rented from a woman named Ruth Ann Hodges. She was close in age, not to mention fun to be with, and the life of the party. He enjoyed her company and began to enjoy life for once in years. Speaking of parties, they got drunk together at a party and had sex soon after returning home. It was Donald's first sexual experience with a woman, and it resulted in the conception of his first child, a son. It was soon after his son was born that he enlisted in the Air Force. Donald met Jim in the Air Force. Donald confessed years later that he fantasized about killing Jim. He said the only reason he refrained from doing so was that he was afraid of getting caught. Jim was well connected within the military, and it was certain that his murder would be thoroughly investigated. Around the time Donald left the Air Force, he tried to commit suicide by taking an overdose of NyQuil. His second suicide attempt was triggered by a family argument. He took large amounts of Placidil and Equinil in hopes that the toxic cocktail would be enough to do him in. These medications are used to treat anxiety and sleep disorders. Before the fatal damage could be done, his family rushed him to a hospital where his stomach was pumped. Following this incident, his family declared to him that he was no longer welcome in their home. During his second admittance for inpatient care for the treatment of his depression, he was restrained to a chair to prevent him from harming himself or others. There he received 21 electroshock treatments. Even after over 20 electric shocks, he was as miserable as ever. Donald got serious about the occult in 1975, and after about two years of theory and practice, he was accepted into a coven in 1977. The sexual ceremonies of this coven focused on the activities of heterosexual couples. 
It was during these rituals that he had more experience with women as sexual partners, this time with a woman named Jan. They would swap with other heterosexual couples. It was about this time that Donald would talk about his family in absolutist terms, either describing them in flattering terms and depicting in the spoken word a childhood that was nothing short of idyllic, or he would characterize it as the nightmare it actually was, without mentioning the sexual abuse. Having been initiated into the coven, a spirit guide was assigned to Donald, that man's name being Duncan. As a corporeal being, Duncan had been a doctor. Now he was an executioner, guiding Donald Harvey as he selected patients at the hospitals who were deemed suited for euthanasia by both personages. More on that later. At the age of 28, Donald was dating a man named Doug. After a particularly nasty argument, Donald's pride was injured. He decided that Doug must not get away with this. He poisoned Doug by slipping some arsenic in his ice cream. It wasn't enough to kill him, but Doug did become violently ill. It gave Donald the confidence to try killing someone again. Donald got promoted to morgue supervisor at the VA Medical Hospital, which couldn't have been more apropos. He also got a little political, joining the National Socialist Party, a neo-Nazi organization. They must not have known about his personal relationships, because it's not exactly the most gay positive assembly. When his membership in this group was exposed to outsiders, he claimed he was never a Nazi that he had friends who were and only wanted to help out. How, by icing swastikas on cupcakes for the potlucks? 1983. Donald had been dating a man named Carl Howaler. One night, Donald had a row with Carl's parents. It got very heated, and Donald was not just angry at Carl's parents, he also resented Carl for not sticking up for him. Donald would kill Carl's father a few months later. He tried to kill Carl's mother on a few occasions. Though Carl was unaware that Donald killed his father and tried to kill his mother, he kicked Donald out of the house in January 1984. Donald and Carl continued to date until 1986. Donald continued to feel rejected by Carl up to then, and tried to kill him several times, but failed. Eventually, they broke up after the fights became more frequent and more heated. Weeks later, Donald drove his car off a cliff. Amazingly, he survived with only a minor head injury. He was deeply depressed and would turn to the occult to cope with his melancholy. Throughout the following year, he killed 23 to 26 people, this is an estimation. Amid his drug use, drinking, and depression, he easily lost count. Eventually, he became so casually disposed to killing people that his confidence in his ability to do so led to carelessness. He got sloppy when he killed a man named John Powell. Powell's autopsy was performed by Dr. Lee Lehman. The details of how Donald left his mark on this corpse were never made public at first, but forensic evidence found enough breadcrumbs to trace the murder back to him. This was the arrest that would lead to him spending the rest of his life in prison. The Murders Donald Harvey committed murder for the first time on May 30th, 1970. He was working a late shift at Marymount Hospital. 88-year-old Logan Evans had a stroke and was just admitted for inpatient care. Unfortunately for him, Donald Harvey was the orderly assigned to his care. One night, when he checked on Evans, he noticed that his vital signs were not fully functional. Donald moved closer to the man to clean him up 
and check his vital signs more closely. As he did so, Logan smeared feces on Donald's face. Stroke victims are at a high risk of developing mental illness, including dementia. In all likelihood, Logan Evans was not himself that night. Most healthcare workers who have the requisite educational background know not to take this sort of action personally. Donald Harvey took it personally. He interpreted it as an affront to his pride. He had been subjected to many humiliating tortures throughout his life, and something within him snapped that night. With feces as war paint, Donald grabbed a pillow and a piece of blue plastic garbage can liner and smothered Evans. He fastened it over his face and would not budge until the man became inanimate. The plastic sheet was placed there to ensure that no amount of oxygen would be admitted. Donald was rational enough to use a stethoscope to check the man's heartbeat. Evans was dead. This was a pivotal moment in the life of Donald Harvey. The first kill is always a transformational experience for a serial killer. Unlike some military veterans who were haunted by some of the things they did on the battlefield, Donald Harvey felt empowered by what he had done. No other act brought power into his hands quite like murder. Logan Evans' destiny hinged upon Donald Harvey's capacity for mercy. And at this moment, the threshold was closed and sealed. Donald was so empowered, he didn't fear prosecution or consequences of any kind. He cleaned up after he was done and went about his business. The doctors and nurses didn't detect or suspect foul play. After all, it's hardly unusual when a stroke survivor perishes soon after the event. There was no autopsy. Donald Harvey's morbid secret died with Logan Evans. He would kill many more patients at Marymount Hospital. You're vulnerable when you're receiving care in a health care facility, and nobody makes a better victim than the vulnerable. For the time being, he was free. Nobody had power over him now that he was prepared to kill anybody who abused the power they thought they had over him. Donald Harvey's second victim was 69-year-old James Tyree, a Marymount patient. This murder was reportedly unintentional. He claims he inserted the wrong size of catheter. Though Tyree didn't complain at first, the pain became increasingly unbearable. He cried out to Donald, begging him to remove it. Donald lost his cool and panicked. He held the man down until Tyree began vomiting blood. Before long, he died. For his next victim, he killed his first female. 44-year-old Elizabeth Wyatt had prayed for death, and Donald Harvey caught wind of this while eavesdropping. He decided to be her fairy godfather and grant her this wish by killing her himself. He accomplished this by turning the level on her oxygen tank to a very low setting. So low, she was found dead four hours later. 43-year-old Eugene McQueen had been a patient at Marymount for a long time. Doctors instructed all his caregivers to refrain from turning him onto his stomach, as this would have put him at risk for potentially fatal complications. Donald ignored this warning and turned Eugene onto his stomach. McQueen died from drowning in his own bodily fluids. Donald told the attending nurse that Eugene McQueen looked bad, but she insisted his condition was stable. To avoid suspicion, Donald bathed McQueen's body and returned it to the bed. The hospital later realized that his death was partly the result of the nurse's poor judgment, and it was covered up. Soon after this incident, Donald used a malfunctioning gas tank on a patient named Harvey Williams. Williams died at the age of 82 from a heart attack. After he died, Donald hid the tank, feeling it might come in handy one day. 
There was nothing unintentional about the next murder. Ben Gilbert was mentally ill. He struck Donald with a urinal so hard that he knocked him out. Gilbert, in his derangement, assumed Donald was a burglar. As Donald lay unconscious on the floor, Gilbert poured the urine all over him. It was the second time a patient weaponized their own bodily fluids against Donald Harvey, and he was just as vindictive the second time around. One day, after some careful preparations, Donald entered Ben Gilbert's room armed with a coat hanger, not the kind covered with felt or decorative fabric twisted into a braid. This was an abortion hanger. Ben saw him coming. Given his distorted perspective at the time, he didn't think there was anything strange about it. Once he was assured the coast was clear, Donald changed Ben's catheter from a man's standard size number 18 catheter to a female's number 20. This resulted in Ben suffering from excruciating pain. Donald had more in store for Ben. He straightened out the coat hanger and inserted it into the catheter. Ben went into shock. It so overwhelmed his body that he went into a coma. Donald inserted the coat hanger so far that it punctured Ben's bladder and bowels. Once Ben was unconscious, Donald cleaned him up and sighted the room to make sure there was no incriminating evidence left behind. He reinserted the correct catheter. Four days later, Ben Gilbert passed away. August 15, 1970. Maud Nichols became a patient at Marymount Hospital, and soon Donald Harvey was inspired to make use of the gas tank he had in storage. Maud was admitted for treatment of severe bed sores. In fact, the bed sores had progressed to the point that maggots were crawling around inside of them. Donald and other attending staff dreaded exposure to this horrific sight. So Donald decided to do everybody a favor and put Maud Nichols out of her misery. Only 15 days passed before Donald Harvey executed his next victim. 58-year-old William Bowling was admitted because of respiratory problems. Donald murdered him by neglecting to turn on his oxygen tank. William died of a heart attack soon after. Donald Harvey would go on to characterize this as a mercy killing. The gas tank would be used as a murder weapon to kill four more patients. He started with 63-year-old Viola Reed Wyan, who was suffering from leukemia and electrolyte imbalance. When smothering her failed, he used the gas tank to finish her off. 80-year-old Sam Carroll suffered from pneumonia and a blockage in his small intestine. Seeing how the man suffered, Donald Harvey gave himself permission to bring about the man's untimely demise. 62-year-old Silas Butner was spared any further suffering from his renal ailments after being killed by Donald Harvey. 82-year-old John V. Combs had heart and respiratory issues. Donald Harvey tried to suffocate him to death, but despite repeated attempts to do so, he brought out his trusty gas tank. Though Donald Harvey insisted the last three murders were euthanasia as opposed to thrill killing, the same could not be argued for his next few victims. Margaret Harrison was 91 years old. No matter how close to death she was, Donald Harvey hastened the process by administering an overdose of Demerol, morphine, and codeine. Speculation has it that this murder might have been accidental since the drugs were intended for another patient. Maggie Rollins was the next to meet her end at the hands of Donald Harvey. She had a serious burn on her left arm, so she wasn't exactly standing astride the grave. Before her burn could heal, Donald Harvey smothered her to death. 90-year-old Milton Bryant Sasser was the next patient who did not survive Donald Harvey's care. Donald administered an overdose of morphine. 
His mistake was flushing the syringe down the toilet. The drain clogged and the needle was found. Nobody knew it had been used by Donald Harvey, but he quit to avoid getting caught all the same. He had killed 15 patients over the span of 10 months. He was 18 years old at the time of his resignation. When Donald Harvey got hired at the Cincinnati VA hospital, he resumed his killing spree. After all, every hospital is equipped with materials that can put a person in their grave. He kicked off his latest murder spree after a five-year hiatus by bringing about the demise of Joseph Harris. Utilizing his experience with oxygen tanks, he simply reduced the levels until Joseph was a goner. This brought back those old euphoric feelings of power that he remembered from his good old days of killing at Marymount. Just like how it only takes one butt to fall ass backwards into a smoking habit, Donald Harvey became a murder junkie again, and all it took was that one victim. To him, every patient was a pre-deceased victim. He confessed to killing four men after this, but could not remember the methods. He remembered their names, James Twitty, James Ritter, Henry Rhodes, and Sterling Moore. At the time, the four deaths were not linked to Donald Harvey. Eventually, Donald would begin to murder people outside of the hospital. While some employees of a hospital might pilfer pens, latex gloves, and the little tubs of vanilla ice cream with the wooden sticks, Donald Harvey steadily but stealthily acquired samples of arsenic and cyanide. Eventually, he built up a cache big enough that he could have helped his neo-Nazi friends bring about their own holocaust. His boyfriend, Doug Hill, was the first to eat a cyanide sundae. But as previously mentioned, he survived. Not even within the white vomit could Donald's culpability be found at the time. His next boyfriend, Carl Hoehler, was doing a lot of bed hopping after having sworn that he was faithful to Donald. It was apparently a fixture of Carl's Monday routine. To prevent this, Donald put arsenic in Carl's food Sunday night so that he would be forced to stay home sick the next day. Carl wasn't the only person in his circle who would fall prey to the nefarious actions of his apothecary boyfriend. Carl's best female friend was a woman named Diane Alexander. Donald speculated that Diane was a threat to his relationship with Carl. He referred to her as Carl's Fag hag, hardly a term of endearment. There was no sign that she would stop hanging out with Carl. So Donald became vindictive and began dreaming up ways to hurt and kill her. In fact, he wished to harm her in unprecedented ways, given his homicidal track record thus far. He wanted her to suffer. He did not want a quick death. He wanted to strike anguish into her heart so that she would suffer even more than the bereaved in her wake. He stole some hepatitis B serum from the hospital and spiked her drink with it. She became sick as a dog, but she recovered. Triumphant, he upped the ante by injecting her somehow with HIV. He failed to succeed at this. If there was a silver lining to this last attack, it was that Donald didn't kill for three years. Serial killers are known by the experts to have cooling off periods where they don't kill at all. It must be exhausting to be that intense all the time. His bloodlust emerged again, and his neighbor, 64-year-old Helen Metzger, had the misfortune to become his next target. His belief was that she posed a threat to both him and Carl. He never elaborated on what the threat entailed, but he was sure that he had to kill her. First, he sprinkled arsenic on some leftover food and then mixed it into a jar of mayonnaise. 
he approached her with the confection under the pretense of being a kindly and generous neighbor. Weeks later, he gave her a pie laced with arsenic. This time, she developed paralysis. Soon she began hemorrhaging and bled to death. The official cause of death was listed as Guillain-Barr syndrome, a muscle weakness condition that emerges in the wake of the deterioration of the immune system. When her family went to her apartment to collect her possessions, they prepared some food with the mayonnaise, and they all got sick. There were no deaths. After his fight with Carl's parents, Donald decided on his method of execution. He spiked their food with arsenic. Henry Howaler had a stroke five days later. His life was saved at the hospital. Donald decided to finish him off by visiting him armed with more arsenic, which he slipped into his pudding. Henry died in his sleep. Kidney failure was documented as the official cause of death. Donald poisoned Carl's mother frequently throughout the following year. She suffered from many illnesses as a result, but did not die. About this time, Donald served wood alcohol from a vodka bottle to his brother-in-law, Howard Vetter. Howard died of a heart attack a week after becoming violently ill. Donald's next victim was a patient named Haram Prophet. Donald killed him accidentally by giving him the wrong dosage of heparin, an anticoagulant. He never reported the error, and nobody ever found out that he was responsible. The next to go was his old boyfriend and nemesis, James Peluso. Peluso could no longer service himself, and Donald was insulted that he was considered a last resort. He dusted James' daiquiri and pudding with arsenic. James died at the VA hospital in short order. James had a recent history of cardiac ailments, so nobody assumed that foul play was a factor. Another neighbor was to meet their end at Donald Harvey's hands, Edward Wilson. Wilson believed that Carl was cheating him when it came to the utility bills. Concerned he would take legal action, Donald put some arsenic into the man's Pepto-Bismol. Edward Wilson died five days later. After losing his job for being in the possession of the duffel bag containing suspicious items, he was hired at Daniel Drake Memorial. Six weeks later, he resumed his killing spree. With his spirit guide Duncan as the devil on his shoulder, Nathani J. Watson was selected as Donald's next victim. Watson was being fed through a gastric tube. Aware that the man was suffering, it was all the consent Donald felt he needed to kill the man. First, he tried killing him with a plastic garbage can liner. He couldn't bring this to completion because people kept interrupting him. He finally brought about his death by placing the liner in both his mouth and nostrils. A nurse found Nathaniel Watson dead 45 minutes later. No investigation was conducted. Donald Harvey felt there was no reason to mourn his passing since he was a rapist, though there was no evidence that this was true. Donald Harvey was on a roll now. Four days after killing Nathani Watson, he murdered 64-year-old Leon Nelson. He smothered him with a plastic waistband liner. One week later, Donald put a new poison in a patient's food, rat poison. 81-year-old Virgil Weedle died of a heart attack soon after. Donald took some cookies that were left by Virgil's family and used them in an occult ceremony with Duncan. The next patient to try the rat poison diet was Lawrence Burnson. He died three days later. Two days later, Carl broke up with Donald. Donald fell into a deep depression. Determined not to suffer alone, Donald put cyanide in the apple juice of a patient named Doris Nally. She died before morning. 
Donald tried to kill Willie Johnson. Johnson was tough. Donald spiked his food with arsenic four times, but no dice. He did manage to snuff out 63-year-old Edward Shravis by slipping arsenic into his soup. The week after, 80-year-old Robert Crockett was poisoned with cyanide when Donald injected it into his IV. The following week, Donald injected cyanide straight into Donald Barney's buttocks. Donald injected cyanide solution into James T. Woods' gastric tube. Woods died on July 26th. Three weeks later, Donald injected a cyanide solution in Ernst C. Frey's gastric tube. He stole a pair of Ernst's boots before leaving. Milton Cantor's nasal tube was the latest to receive a dose of cyanide from Donald Harvey. He stole a blanket from Milton. September 17, 1986. Roger Evans had cyanide injected into his gastric tube by Donald Harvey. September 20th, 69-year-old Claiborne Kendrick received the cyanide solution right in the balls. Now that had to be personal. Just under a month later, Albert Bowman was given drinking water spiked with cyanide by Donald Harvey. Only a day later, William Collins had a glass of cyanide-laced orange juice. After a five-day hiatus, Donald Harvey couldn't resist killing any longer. 78-year-old Henry Cody received a cocktail of cyanide and water in his gastric tube. Two weeks later, Moza Thompson met his end under the same circumstances. Two weeks later, Otis Day's final day ended with a cyanide solution, with no further days to come. Cleo Fish was fond of cranberry juice, but never with a splash of cyanide. With Donald Harvey as her bartender, she drank to her death. Once she died, he cut off a lock of her hair to be used in a ritual with Duncan. Donald Harvey killed seven people over the span of five months. Autopsies were either not performed or not authorized. Donald came to view himself as being godlike. He didn't have the power to create, but he could destroy, and he was doing it with impunity. Before the end of the year, he tried to murder two more patients, both with arsenic. The patients in question were Harold White and John Ollendick. Fortunately for both men, the dosages were too small to kill them. January 10, 1987, Donald Harvey gave Leo Parker a late Christmas gift of cyanide in his feed bag. In February, he escorted Margaret Cookrow and Stella Lemon to the grave. He served them up a screwdriver, with the difference being a mixer of OJ and cyanide. Margaret died shortly thereafter, but it took Stella weeks to perish after a slow and painful death. Donald introduced a new murder weapon to his arsenal. Dedichol. It's used to remove glue and other adhesives. Donald Harvey used it to remove people. On March 6th, he placed some Dedichol in Joseph Pike's food, as if hospital food isn't bad enough. Joseph died almost instantaneously. The next day, Hilda Letts drank some down with her orange juice. She too died soon after. No autopsies were performed in either case. Donald Harvey was on a roll and decided to cap off the day by poisoning John Powell. After spending months in a coma following a motorcycle accident, Powell was showing signs of improvement. 
Doctors expected him to make full recovery, which is why they were shocked when he died out of the blue. An autopsy was performed for this death. As luck had it, the assistant coroner happened to also be a biochemist. March 8th, 1986, Dr. Lee Lemon surgically opened the corpse of John Powell. The odor of bitter almonds saturated the air from Powell's organs. This was the surest sign that the man died from cyanide poisoning. Three labs tested samples that were taken, and all three results were positive for cyanide. There was no way John Powell died from natural causes. Everyone who treated John Powell was a suspect. For the first time, Donald Harvey would be examined as the potential perpetrator of a homicide. Donald Harvey's past was examined not just at this hospital, but at his previous workplaces. He was nicknamed the Angel of Death by his former colleagues. It wasn't that they suspected him of killing patients. They didn't. But he always happened to treat patients shortly before they died. Now that was looking very suspicious, especially to the police. Donald Harvey became suspect number one. Donald's co-workers volunteered to take polygraph tests. Donald knew that a refusal would look suspicious. He dreaded the day when he would find himself under the microscope. He bought and read a book about how to beat polygraph examinations, but there was no way for him to practice, so it didn't do him any good. He called in sick on the day of the polygraph. Naturally, the police suspected this was an attempt to avoid being investigated. Two more detectives were assigned to the case, Jim Lawson and Ron Camden. They summoned him to the station for questioning. For a few hours, the officers took the good cop, bad cop approach. Though he admitted nothing at first, they eventually wore him down. He confessed, though he wasn't exactly a geyser of details. He confessed to the murder of John Powell, insisting it was more a case of euthanasia than cold-blooded murder. He said he felt sorry for Powell because he was suffering and he could tell his family was suffering in their own right, mourning the man he had been. He said he put the cyanide in his gastric tube to bring about an end to the grim reality of Powell's final days. Donald said he didn't kill anyone else. He didn't budge from this position. The detectives obtained a search warrant and headed to Donald Harvey's home. The search of Donald Harvey's domicile was worthwhile. Among the incriminating items were 30 pounds of cyanide. So much poison, it would amount to power lifting for an anemic. There were entire jars of arsenic. Though unrelated to the murders, they found books on the occult, items utilized in performing rituals, other kinds of poisons. Donald's diary was another big score for the evidence trove. Given all this, the detectives were now convinced that John Powell's murder was unlikely to be an isolated incident. April 6, 1987. Donald Harvey was arrested on one count of aggravated murder, in hopes to avoid serving time in prison, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. It was not likely to work since his long record of hoarding poisons and the methodical administration of such suggested a proclivity toward impulse control and long-term planning. His brain was a well-oiled machine. He wasn't running amuck with a gun in his hand and screaming at invisible conspirators. This plea deal was permitted, but Donald was held on $200,000 bond until the conclusion of all hearings. A month later, Donald Harvey was examined by two court-appointed psychiatrists. He was diagnosed depressed but sane. He was deemed fit to stand trial. So much for the insanity plea. 
Five women who worked at Drake Memorial Hospital as nurses reported to a journalist that they knew that John Powell's death was not an isolated incident. They were told by the hospital's administration not to discuss it with outsiders or else they would lose their jobs. The hospital was determined to maintain its reputation with a cover-up. Finding the evidence was difficult. The only thing the journalist could get his hands on was Donald Harvey's work schedule. One day, William Whalen, Donald Harvey's public defender, asked Donald point-blank if he killed anybody besides John Powell. Donald nodded. Donald said he killed about 70 people. Whalen wasn't exactly thrilled to hear this. It's tough to advocate for someone who has committed one murder, let alone dozens. Whalen gave the journalist carte blanche to publicize this new data. Cincinnati now knew it had a serial killer in its midst. A plea bargain was drafted and submitted to the court. Donald Harvey would not be executed via the electric chair provided he list all the homicides and describe them in detail. August 18, 1987. Donald Harvey pled guilty to one count of felonious assault, four counts of attempted murder, and 36 counts of aggravated murder. He received three 20-year sentences to be served consecutively. He was also slapped with a $250,000 fine. 1988, Donald Harvey appeared in Hamilton County's plea court. There he was indicted for three more murders and three attempted murders. He received a 20-year sentence for each murder charge. For each attempted murder charge, he was sentenced to 20 to 25 years. Those sentences were to be served concurrently with his other sentences. September 6th, 1988. Donald Harvey agreed to confess to all the murders he committed at Marymount Hospital on tape. He confessed to 13, but was only convicted for nine. Four went unconfirmed. He was given eight counts for murder and one for voluntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for each murder and 20 years for the manslaughter charge. These ran concurrently with the sentences he received in Hamilton County. Lawsuits amounting to $235 million were filed against Donald Harvey in Hamilton County. Jan Taylor, who was a supervisor at Drake Memorial, pled guilty to one charge of falsifying records, but did not do time. All told, Donald Harvey killed 87 people. He was no Jack Kevorkian. Most of these deaths were committed to slake his thirst for blood. May 30th, 2017. Donald Harvey was found dead in his cell in Toledo. He had been beaten to death on the 28th. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.